Okay, and I just want to do a quick uh, intro. Uh, so this month, we're studying public banking. Uh, the series is designed to highlight the growing movement across the Commonwealth to bring a public bank to Massachusetts. This is Ujima's flagship issue in partnership with the Massachusetts Public Banking Coalition, some of whom are present tonight, Black Economic Council of Massachusetts, otherwise known as BECMA, Black Mass Coalition, a coalition whose members include Ujima, BECMA, the North American Indian Center of Boston, also known as NACOB, King Boston, City Life Vita Urbana, and Young Abolitionists, and more. Uh, I'd also like to just give a quick shout out to the Philadelphia Public Banking Coalition, as we have a member of that coalition here tonight. And there is a, 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 a movement to uh, bring a municipal public bank to Philadelphia. Uh, the Massachusetts Public Bank will be a financially sustainable institution designed to address the needs of small businesses, community development institutions, municipalities, land trusts, and local agriculture. It will work cooperatively, not competitively, with Massachusetts community banks. And tonight, we are continuing our series on public banking with Michael Swack and Gerardo Espinoza. Uh, Michael Swack will talk about the case for a public bank, and uh, both Michael and Gerardo will uh, talk about CDF buys and racial equity. And with that said, uh, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nia. So I wanted to start by asking three questions uh, that we should try to answer, which I will try to answer, which is, do we really need a public bank? After all, Commonwealth has many, many banks and credit unions. Uh, why another one? The second question is, if we create a bank, uh, is it a sustainable business model? That is, is it gonna run out of money or will it be able to grow and sustain itself over time? An important question. And the third is, can risk be effectively managed? After all, we're asking the bank to make investments that mainstream financial institutions typically don't because they consider it to be too risky. And so we need to ask the question, is it risky? Uh, uh, and can risk be effectively managed? So those are the three questions that I'm going to try and answer now. So the starting point on whether we need a public bank in Massachusetts is really relates to this question of, is there demand for what they can offer? That is, are there loans that it could make or are others already making these loans right now? One of the things that we did when we started to work with Beckman and Ujima and others on, on this project, and, and I joined uh, earlier this year, this spring, was to say, well, let, let's ask people who are making loans the question. And so we designed a, a survey and there are 28 community development financial institutions in Massachusetts. These are institutions whose mission it is to serve the financing needs of the underserved uh, communities throughout uh, Massachusetts. We were able to talk to 15 of them. Uh, collectively, the community development financial institutions in Massachusetts manage 2.2 billion in assets. And of that, they have deployed 86% of their assets. Now, for those who don't look at numbers on a regular basis like I do, um, which is you know pretty boring, but um, an 86 deploy percent deployment rate is really out of this world. That means that they're really, the dollars they're getting, they're putting in. Usually the deployment rates are less. Just to give you an example, the uh, average deployment rate of banks in Massachusetts is around 70%. 86% means these CDFIs, these community lenders, are getting money out the door. And we know that they're also getting them out the door and purposely and, and directing them, as you see there, that by virtue of their CDFI certification, they uh, are required to direct money towards improving the social and economic conditions of underserved people and or residents of economically distressed communities. And they have to document that each year. So it's not like they can just say it, they have to show that they're doing it. They have to turn in a certification report on an annual basis 
that reports the loans that they're making, where they're being made, and who they're being loaned to. And their annual certification is dependent on meeting that. According to national data that we looked at, on average, CDFI clients are 84% low income, low wealth, or from historically disinvested communities, 60% people of color, and 50% women. And those figures are pretty consistent with what we see in Massachusetts as well. We know that Massachusetts CDFIs have an unmet demand for capital. 55% of the ones we surveyed, in addition to having very high deployment rates, told us that their capital needs are urgent or somewhat urgent right now. Another data point is the Boston Foundation estimates that the annual unmet need for capital among entrepreneur, entrepreneurs of color is $574 million. So this first question, is there a need? I think the answer is that demonstrated by the CDFIs is yes, there's absolutely a need. The money we already have is, is deployed and we could really use more money. So these CDFIs are, are really a good proxy uh, for money getting out. And, and uh, the term that Nia used when we presented this the other day is, is that this public bank would be part of a financial ecosystem. It's not going to solve all problems, but by being an institution that will work with the CDFIs, it'll create more capital, more opportunities for the CDFIs to do the work that they want. So that's a real positive and that's a definite yes in terms of a need. The second question is, is it a sustainable business model? That is, will the public bank be able to reach underserved communities uh, through this ecosystem that we talked about? Uh, they'll, they'll work through various intermediaries uh, but will they be able to sustain itself? Well, we believe the answer to this question is yes as well. That is the, uh, the structure of the bank will, will say that the treasury will be a, a, a single depositor that reduces the operating costs. That is one of the things we look for is, is a bank efficiency ratio is one of the measures of how a bank is, is doing. So an efficiency ratio is, is a calculation that essentially shows a bank's profitability. So to calculate the efficiency ratio, what you basically is do, you take the bank's expenses uh, 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 and divide a bank's expenses by its net revenue. Uh, what this means the, is that, uh, for example, if a bank had a net revenue of $100 million and expenses of $65 million, the efficiency ratio would be 65%. Well, Essentially, the public bank is eliminating a lot of the costs because they're not dealing directly with, with uh, individual depositors. So if we look at the Bank of North Dakota, for example, a, a state bank, their efficiency ratio is 18%. The Massachusetts banks on the whole have an efficiency ratio of 77%. So you see quite a difference. Our estimate is that Massachusetts would be somewhere in between, but probably closer to the efficiency ratio of the Bank of North Dakota. Again, they don't have to spend a lot of money trying to attract depositors. Uh, they don't have to spend a lot of money on the, the transaction costs of, of, uh, of dealing with uh, individual accounts. And so we would expect that they would be very efficient. They can also provide, uh, in terms of the, the business model, the kind of money that CDFIs need, which is long-term fixed rate money. This is a demand that other banks, and there are many banks uh, across the country and in Massachusetts that invest in CDFIs, but generally they invest short-term money. CDFIs, CDFIs face what we call an asset liability management problem. That is, they wanna make long-term loans, like for mortgages, but the investors they get usually lend for short-term. That means you're trying to constantly balance how do you pay back your investors who have short-term money while still lending to your borrowers who want long-term money. The public bank can help in that regard because the public bank will be in a position to make longer-term commitments to CDFIs. And as you see there, over half, 51% uh, of CDFIs express demand for 10-year money at 3%. This is a reasonable type of investment for a public bank to make. In addition to lending to this ecosystem of intermediaries of CDFIs, and by the way, I, uh, uh, they're CDFIs, but generally we're talking about the bank lending to mission-based lenders, 
so this would include Ujima when we talk about mission-based lenders. You don't have to be a certified CDFI to be a mission-based lender, uh, uh, but that's who the bank would serve. In addition, the bank will be able to make uh, direct loans to larger projects. Many of the CDFIs that we talked to said that they were interested in financing larger projects, but they didn't have the capacity themselves. Uh, so a public bank could either invest through the CDFI or directly in the project itself. Uh, and they can also invest in local government projects and projects where quasi-publics like the housing finance uh, agency would, would uh, be involved in projects as well. Uh, the survey we did again demonstrates strong demand for such collaboration. The CDFIs would like to collaborate more and co-lend with banks, uh, uh, which is one of the opportunities they'll have, and also the opportunity for the public bank to invest in them. So we see based on uh, looking at uh, who the bank would serve, efficiency ratios of other banks, looking at Bank of North Dakota, uh, with a $200 million capitalization over four years, the public bank should not only be sustainable, but should be able to grow larger, leverage more funds. The third question we have is, can the bank manage risk? One of the things that's important to say is that CDFIs have an excellent record of serving their communities while successfully managing risk. The best evidence for that is looking at actual rates over time. So if you look at losses over a period of 20 years, meaning CDFIs have gone through a couple business cycles already. Uh, think of the, the bank crash of 2008, where many of the banks were insolvent. CDFIs had relatively small losses compared and, and, and stayed in business, were not insolvent. Uh, the loss rates are, are very comparable to what you would see in conventional banks. Uh, so why don't more people invest in them? Well, there's still the perception of risk that, that, that we have to deal with. And uh, there's also what CDFIs do is, is they're willing to undertake the transaction costs, the, the costs of making loans to, of making smaller loans to borrowers that, that banks often don't like to make. They're, they're too expensive. It's much better to make a one loan, a conventional loan of a of million dollars than it is to make a hundred loans of $10,000 uh, just because the transaction costs are high. Second, the, the CDFIs are really well protected because they have strong balance sheets. They have net assets. What that means is uh, that CDFIs in aggregate uh, have a, a capital ratio of 24%. That means they aren't as highly leveraged. That means they're only leveraging about $4 uh, uh, to a dollar where banks are leveraging about $10 for every dollar they have in capital. This is important because what this capital ratio means, what this more money means is even if there were losses, CDFIs are better equipped to pay back their investors because they keep substantial capital and reserves uh, to make sure that they can pay back their investors. So these multiple layers of protection mean that the, the public bank by investing in these projects is really taking a very low risk. Uh, very few CDFIs uh, uh, have lost money and, and almost none have lost investors money. So this is a, a good uh, uh, way to demonstrate that the bank can make investments in the types of projects we want while sustaining itself and also managing risk effectively. Some of you may see that a CDFI was one of the lenders that created uh, this solar uh, infrastructure at, at Madison Park. I mean, if you are familiar with that. And uh, we can share this, uh, these slides with you. Uh, but uh, to summarize my three questions again, uh, there's strong demand for targeted capital. Uh, uh, the bank would be sustainable. It's a sustainable business model, and there's a lot of evidence to show that. And uh, the bank can manage risk and make sure that uh, the investments are, are handled well and, and that they'll be paid back. So let me stop here. And Gerardo, uh, I'm going to stop the share and turn it over to you. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, Michael. The, 
Michael uh, teaches uh, at UNH and um, he has this uh, macro framework of things, which is great to introduce the topic. My mind is a li little bit simpler than Mike's and, uh, <laughs> and I'll go yes with some illustrations. So I think that uh, can complement the points that uh, Mike was made, Michael was making in terms of uh, how the, the public bank would be helpful. The, the organization that where I serve as, C, as ED is uh, called LEAF, Local Enterprise Assistance Fund, and the, it's a CDFI. And the, uh, basically what we do is, uh, I always think of the CDFIs as small little banks. They take funds from different sources and then they deploy those funds, right? And, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll have a couple of illustrations of, of the type of activity that we do that I think support the creation of the, of the public bank. So le let me start with one illustration, which is that uh, part of the Part of the work that we do is with um, small businesses and in our cases, particularly in, in small businesses of communities of color. And one characteristic of the business that, uh, that of CDFIs that are doing activities with small businesses is that normally they provide what is called technical assistance, right? So it's something that the banks don't do uh, and CDFI is uh, working with the small business as part of the activity to, to work with the, uh, with the clients, either in terms of projections or help them with business plan or help them to access resources or help them with marketing. So it's uh, a little like a little consulting company helping the small business. So the, and, and one of the best illustrations that I have of the type of work that we do in that area is, uh, is uh, the, a company that some of you may know that is Jamaica Me Hungry. Uh, they uh, have a couple of restaurants now uh, and, and uh, when we got to know them was at Commonwealth Kitchen when we were doing technical assistance. I think at the time, um, Ernie uh, Campbell, the, the owner of the company, he had a, a couple of food trucks and, and was thinking about uh, uh, his own location. He was renting a space at the Commonwealth Kitchen. So our technical team worked with him and, uh, and at the time we made a small loan, I think it was like $30,000 and kept, him, kept supporting him towards his expansion of finding a new place. He found a new place in Jamaica Plain and uh, we provided financing and there I think it was $250,000. So in addition to the food truck and catering business, now he had the location. During the crisis, um, during the crisis uh, of COVID crisis, uh, Bank Space became available in Allston, Brighton, and they took over that space. So now they have the two, two, two restaurants plus the catering business. And recently, I think in the Southport area of Boston, Amazon uh, is building a new building and they were invited to, to basically be one of the tenants in that business with the, another location for Jamaica Me Hungry. So the, all that is happening in the process of you know, now. So from, if we look at it, from five years to now, what we have is someone that at the moment that we met him uh, only had a couple of employees. 
And uh, even before the expansion to the South Port, he already has 20 employees, uh, has uh, obviously generated uh, jobs. Um, in the process of that has created some wealth uh, with the aspect of the expansions to South Port, all of this will be magnified. And uh, now he is a perfect uh, bank client, right? So uh, just went from this experience, wanted to highlight a couple of points. Uh, 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 at, the, at the point where we started working with him, um, technical assistance is not something that banks provide. So he would not have received that. Uh, so a small loan for $30,000 probably is not of interest to a bank. So he might have had a tough time doing that. And those were ingredients that helped to lead his expansion. Now, even when we made a $250,000 loan, a bank might have had difficulty there because of the aspect of equity and collateral for, for the loan. So the, the point I want to make is the, when we, the, there are some spaces that the banks for a number of reasons are currently not, not serving and the, the CDFIs can serve that space and that client eventually can become a, a client for the bank, right? So the, the, how does the public bank come in here? The, the public bank, particularly in Massachusetts, would be another source of support or funding for the CDFIs. So we would be able to do more of what we do uh, with the existence of the public bank. And also the CDFIs in some way would also help the public bank because we already exist. We have an established network of people doing the technical assistance, doing the lending. So that's a function that um, the, the public bank doesn't have to do. And those are the efficiencies that Michael was referring to. So it's a very nice complementarity between the CDFIs, the public bank, and I would say with the established commercial banks, right? So that's one, that is one illustration. And uh, let me just check with Mia. Mia do, I, Mia, do I have time for one more illustration? Yes, you do, Gerardo. Thank you. The, the other one that I, I like a lot is, uh, uh, because it really highlights the importance of the public bank, is part of the work we do is um, uh, with uh, cooperatives and land trusts in the area of affordable housing. And in both cases, there is an interesting situation. In the case of um, uh, co uh, cooperative housing, I think one particular model, and, um, and, and that's a model that Michael knows very well uh, because it was pioneered by New Hampshire Loan Fund, uh, bank uh, CDFI in New Hampshire, where uh, Michael has served as board member for a number of years. The, and I think they might have gotten into this because of Michael. The, it's a situation where the ownership of the home is different than the ownership of the land, right? And that is a situation that in the past used to be called mobile homes or trailer mm -hmm. homes. Uh, that no longer applies because I believe since the 70s, they have, a they were, um, uh, those homes are being made by, according to housing code. So they are much better, uh, much better residences. Now the, the characteristic there is that the homes are mobile, but they need to be in a place and that place is normally owned by an investor. So typically what you find there is what are called home parks where the, there may be 250 mobile homes in a specific tract of land. And um, the, in those, and, and something similar happens with the land trust where the ownership of the home is separate from the ownership of the land. Once you have those type of situations, uh, the banking system, that's not a model that they are familiar with for their typical mortgages that goes with a home and a land. 
So once you have that, is uh, pretty much they don't know what to do with that, right? And um, I think we're not talking about the specific situations here because, for instance, uh, for for this type of manufactured home, about 12 to 14 million people in the U.S. live in those types of homes. And in Massachusetts, we have 26,000 homes and uh, 26,000 mobile homes. Uh, they are in, 20, in 251 different parks. And uh, the problem here is that the persons that own those homes, those homes typically the range is from 70,000 to about 120, 130,000. And the ownership on those homes is both for persons that are categorized as very low income persons, not only low income, but very low income persons where the median income is 60% below the area median income. And those persons can be displaced at any time because at any time the investor can decide to sell the land and the community has to move somewhere else, right? And uh, in moving a home is, is an expensive proposition there. And so the, it's a situation where they are in constant fear of, of, of this event happening and and the way that uh, some CDFIs work with this is there is, uh, given the great uh, experience of New Hampshire Loan Fund, another entity was created out of New Hampshire called Resident Home Communities USA or Rock USA. So Rock USA is the leader and some other CDFIs like LEAF participate with them. What, uh, what we do is we help those uh, residents form a cooperative. And then we provide the funding so that the residents as a cooperative can buy the, can buy the land. So the end result is that you have each mobile home is still owned by each individual owner, but cooperatively they own the land. Right? So the now, when they own the land, they cannot be displaced because they are the owners, right? And something that I found very interesting here, the, in, typically when we have this, uh, uh, after each transaction, there is a closing ceremony. And I remember in one instance, uh, actually, this was in Massachusetts. Uh, in one of the ceremonies, the, the president of the Ascop Association uh, was from Mexico. He had lived in that community for 15 years. And he told me that before they, they, were, they became a, a, a co-op, he knew, having lived there for 15 years in that park that had like 200 mobile homes, he knew only five homes around his home, right? And his words were exactly, now we have to, we have these meetings all the time because as a co-op, we need to meet to make decisions. How much is the rent? What are we going to do with a community facility? And his words were, now we are a community, right? And to me, that sounded interesting because before, I was viewing this just as a financial transaction where they, they own the land. But in the process of this financial, we, what they actually was created was a, a community, right? And, uh, and now uh, linking this to the public bank, right? So this is a situation where the banks don't know what to do and there are these intermediaries like CDFIs that come and, and get the ownership of the land and that's great, but what do these CDFIs need. Again, we're talking about housing. And one of the things that you need to do there is to be able to provide, uh, to make it affordable, you need very low interest rates. And also you need very long term financing, right? And that's exactly what Michael was uh, mentioning during the presentation as one of the benefits of the public bank. They can provide long-term financing that is very difficult now for CDFI to obtain. When I say long-term financing is 10 years or more and, and, and low cost financing. So having that support from the CD, from the public bank would allow the, 
the CDFIs to do more of this uh, type of work and even to do it better, perhaps even at, at, at lower cost for this type of uh, very low uh, income uh, persons. Uh, so those are just two illustrations where I can see very well how this fits uh, uh, with the world of CDFIs, how the public bank fits in the world of CDFIs, mm -hmm. and that could allow to do transactions that somehow now are overlooked by the bank, uh, commercial banking system and, um, and were feeling a niche need there. So I, I, I'll stop there and thank you, Nia, for the time. Thank you so much, Gerardo, and thank you so much, Michael. And uh, now we'll open up for questions. Um, just really quickly, I'm dropping in the chat um, the link to uh, Massachusetts Public Banking Coalition's website. Um, I'm dropping in the link to the Get Involved uh, page. So um, I've seen some in engagement from some of you all. So if you're wondering, how can I help? How can I have a role? Uh, that page can let you know how you can be helpful with the uh, legislation. And I'm also going to drop into the chat uh, the Facebook page um, of a coalition and ask you to check it out, like it, share it with your friends. Um, and we're open for questions, reflections, comments. We also have Nadav uh, here tonight, who was one of our presenters uh, last week and uh, who was showing us um, kind of just the, the nuts and bolts of, of, how a, um, of how banks in general work. Um, so yeah, it's open. And, and we see we have a question in the chat from Siona. So Siona says, uh, would it make sense to sprout? This is an interesting question. Would it make sense to sprout a public bank out of an existing CDFI? Uh, kind of like a pivot by the CDFI. It's very interesting. Well, I, I can try and answer that. Um, uh, I think it would be difficult. CDFIs are by statute um, private, mostly nonprofit, although there are some for-profit banks, but they still are required to meet the same mission as, as part of their certification in terms of the communities they serve. Uh, so it'd be difficult because part of what the legislation ask, is asking for is, is public money to capitalize uh, a public bank. And so it's, it would probably be a, a new institution. It's hard to think of, of why the state would ask a, a, a private entity to create an institution that would be a, a, a public institution with a, with a public purpose. Um, it may not be impossible, but I think it would be a lot easier to um, to do it the way that it's being proposed right now, to, to create a public institution accountable to the public sector using public money to capitalize it. So I see Nadav has uh, his hand raised as well. Nadav? Yeah, so I absolutely agree with everything. I, I think there are two, two basic pieces to it. So, um, you know, remember what a balance sheet is. It's assets, liabilities, and equity. So CDFIs have exactly the kind of assets that a public bank should finance, so check. Um, as far as equity, right, Michael's point, we, we want the public bank to be a publicly owned institution, which means that the equity needs to be held by, by the public. So that is that piece is inconsistent with just building on an existing CDFI. Um, and third, and very, very importantly, remember the deposit. So what, what kind of a creature is a bank? A bank is a machine that takes a little bit of capital and leverages it many, many, many times over. You saw it in Michael's presentation with, with those high leverage ratios, right? To do this, we need deposits. And to get deposits, we need a bank charter, okay? And most CDFIs today, we can talk about exceptions, do not do not have banking banking charters. So that's that's another essential piece of this equation. I, I would just mention, because uh, Peter put in the chat, we envision our Philadelphia Public Bank becoming a CDFI. I, I do think that could be a, a, a problem uh, because the CDFI legislation specifically states that they'll finance, that they'll, that CDFIs are, are private uh, financial institutions and not public. 
So I think you'd run into problem trying to certify as a CDFI. Second, it says being CDFI gains access to 9 billion CDFI fund. Yeah, we sort of wish it was that. There was a one-time appropriation, a lot of going to CDFIs, but the annual appropriation for the CDFI fund has been more typically in the $250 million range and, and uh, not in the billions. I mean, we, we've tried a couple times in the past years, uh, even going back to the Obama administration to get, uh, to get it increased to a billion dollars and, and haven't been successful. This uh, additional money that Peter refers to is, is COVID directed money, uh, a one-time deal. And there are certain conditions in terms of who qualifies. Thank you, Michael. Uh, great conversation so far. We have if a, I can interject, uh, another... Nia. Yeah, sure, Peter. Uh, yeah, I, the question that was originally asked is, is whether the Massachusetts uh, Public Bank could acquire a CDFI and uh, sort of have a, a shortcut to, to being in the game. Uh, I agree that that's not a good way to go. Uh, we, I agree ex absolutely with, with Michael that the way to, to begin is with a public bank that has a, a, a public uh, formation and uh, works with the local law uh, in Massachusetts the same way we're working with the local law in, in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. Um, but what we have researched and found is that uh, as the, the bank grows in its public purpose, uh, it can qualify to become a, a CDFI and, um, and therefore uh, engage in partnership with the other CD, CDFIs in the environment, in the ec ecosystem, uh, in a partnership arrangement, which is very similar to the way in which the Bank of North Dakota partners with its local banks. Anybody want to respond to that? So Peter is um, asserting that eventually, this is what I'm hearing, a public bank could qualify to become a CDFI. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure personally, sorry, sorry for jumping in if, if there are other folks who- No, want. this is open. Yep. But, but then this will be kind of like the last round of comments because Nora did ask two questions in the chat. So I do want to get to that. Yeah, so, so I mean, at some level, I think they're related. So one thing, one thing that is important to understand from a corporate finance point of view is that um, the public bank is not only going to hold the type of loans that CDFIs hold. It's also going to in, to hold debt of CDFIs, right? That's a point that Michael made. That is a, diff, a very different thing from the point of view of risk management than holding those loans directly. Because the CDFI's capital is standing between the public bank and risk, okay? So that that cannot be done with just by building on an existing CDFI. If you're porting into an existing CDFI, you hold that risk directly. There's no extra capital that, that is protecting it. Um, I think another piece is that the, you know, the credit unions that are CDFIs, even, even though they're CDFIs, they do lots of different things and they serve, um, their funding comes from small, today their funding comes from small depositors and you heard Michael, this has very high operating costs, okay, so we really want to create a separate conduit that is dedicated to this person and, and, and can engage in it directly and exclusively. Excellent. Thank you. And again, really, I think this is a, a rich conversation. So thank you um, all for questions and responses. Uh, Nora has asked in the chat, um, not clear based on what you've presented so far. What if the state directly invested in a variety of CDFIs? So setting up a new and some, uh, I think where this is coming from, is setting up a new bank requires time, staff, costs, work, um, there are CDFI credit unions that accept deposits. Right. So um, I'm just looking back at the, uh, what was the first part of the question again? Yeah. I just dropped it in again, but it's uh, worth saying out loud again. Uh, not clear based on what you've presented so far. What if the state directly invested in a variety of CDFIs? Why? That's, 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 what, that, that's oh, what we're proposing, is that they would invest in a variety of CDFIs. I mean, ideally, they would invest in all the CDFIs. Um, I, guess, CDFI I was thinking without creating a bank in between. 
you would need a huge oh, appreciation for that, Nora. So, yeah, so okay. we're, sure. we're talking about we're talking about um, 1.6 billion dollars in public bank assets, and that is achieved with only 200 million in in in, in an actual appropriation for capital. So we're we're talking about an appropriation that would be an order of magnitude greater and and that much more politically difficult to obtain. I mean, having said that, Nora, I, I mean, I think the, the answer is both. That that ideally. Massachusetts and, and other states have done this, have created a, a statewide CDFI fund in which they would invest uh, equity uh, uh, or, or grant dollars more specifically for the nonprofits. I mean, the limitation of the bank is it, it's not a panacea. It, it, it will provide some debt financing, but you know, if you ask CDFIs what they really need, it, it's grant money to, to build up their balance sheets, to bring right. up that capital ratio I talked about earlier. So you know, ideally, this would go hand in hand with a, a bill that would provide two hundred million dollars of direct grant funding to to build the balance sheet for CDFIs, or or create a, a regularly funded program of, you know, ten or twenty million dollars annually be, to be distributed to uh, CDFIs to carry out their work. Uh, so, uh, two different purposes, both serving the the broader purpose of increasing the flow of capital. Thank you, Michael. And what I'd like to add to that really quickly, Nora, I couldn't find the link uh, fast enough, but um, the capital gap report that the Boston Foundation uh, mm -hmm. released recently, I think it's along the order of, of what both you and Michael have just discussed, which is they are uh, supporting a public bank. So they say we should have a public bank and they also call for several different types of funds. And the idea is uh, we, would, we would do it all essentially. Thank you. Um, I guess then my other question was sort of on the flip side. I know the title of this uh, evening's presentation was CDFIs and Racial Equity. And I'm curious, um, I will confess that I used to, I worked at a CDFI for a long time. And um, I'm curious uh, what Geraldo and Michael see as like current CDFI challenges, not entirely around racial equity, but including racial equity. Right. Well, CDFIs face uh, a number of challenges. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, some of the major challenges have to do with, with raising the, the equity or permanent capital uh, uh, where they've been really overly dependent. I mean, if you look at CDFIs, there are two primary sources of, of uh, investment and, and grant money are from the banks who are meeting their CRA requirements and from the federal government through the, through the fund. Uh, the other is that, I mean, not, not to get too deep into the weeds, but, but um, you know, CDFIs uh, have, have a mixed track record in, in terms of lending in minority communities. There's some who've done it very well and, and, and others who haven't. CDFIs, one of the questions is, are, are there too many of them? Because there are a lot of smaller ones that really struggle uh, uh, just to get by. Uh, whereas the larger ones now are reaching a stage where they uh, can sustain their operations based on the revenue they generate from their operations. Uh, it would be good to see the smaller ones collaborate more. They generally don't. Uh, most CDFIs see themselves as, you know, as uh, institutions that serve a particular community, but, but don't collaborate well in terms of even forming a co-op of CDFIs that would share an operating system that would take care of all their backroom activities. CDFIs still spend an enormous amount of money just on, on basic operations and raising money. Um, so there are a lot of things CDIs, CDFIs could do to improve their performance, both in their own operations and uh, uh, being better at, at uh, what they lend to. You know, part of it too is that they have to manage their own risk. And, and this in some ways limits their ability to do some of the projects they would, they would like to do because they don't necessarily have the reserves or, or the, uh, the capital on their balance sheet. So that's a, a short answer. We could talk about it for a long time. Thank you, Michael. Michael. 
I'm gonna drop uh, Siona's question in the chat. And we did get an answer from Peter about the um, uh, public bank and Bank of American Samoa. Um, but I think it's also just worthwhile knowing about what's happening in Massachusetts as well. Uh, and this was uh, 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 plus one by Charles. So Siona asked, uh, curious about how the Federal Reserve Bank has weighed in public banking and or if they have helped with elevating this path uh, legislatively. Well, it, it, as far as I know, and Nadav, I, I, you may know more, the Federal Reserve Bank is, is aware of this. I think according to the statute, they would serve on the, uh, on the governing board of, of, of a public bank. Um, I don't think they've come out one way or another in, in favor or against, and I would be surprised if they did because they, it would be seen as a, as a more political activity. Uh, the way the bank is constructed, it would be a regulated financial institution. I'm not sure, I, I would guess their regulator from among the various regulators probably would be the Fed and, and not the Office of the Control of the Currency. Um, so I don't know, Nandav, uh, uh, Nia, you were saying that they've come out against the public bank. I, I didn't know that. Um, Nadav, yeah. do you want to go ahead and weigh in? Yeah. Well, that yeah was I mean, in one thing I want to say is, um, so the, the primary supervisor is probably going to be the state division of banks um, in terms of day-to-day -day operations. The Fed, you know, as far as I know, has not come out one way or the other. Um, as mentioned in the chat, they did issue a 2011 study um, as part of a broader legislative committee committee that studied public banks a decade ago. Um, but that was a design, that was a public bank campaign. It was a, a design for the public bank that was very, very, very different from the one that we're mm -hmm. facing today. And we're not, we're not expecting these lines of opposition to, to recur. I think Nia and Yeah, I think the and I think the only thing that I'll add is my understanding at the time, as Nadav said, was in the study. Um, I think there was a lot of focus on uh, Bank of Dakota, either in the study, Bank of North Dakota, which we talk about as well, which Ujima was definitely inspired by, um, and also in the conversation. And my understanding is one of their primary kind of sticking points was well, we're talking about different economies. And so to, to, um, to kind of see the bank or to capitalize the bank, we would need orders of magnitude, more capital than Bank of North Dakota required. And that seemed to be kind of the major kind of, it's not feasible um, at, at, at this time. Um, but uh, Ruth has said in the chat and so is Nadav. Um, also, they were also, the conversation was also about a very different model uh, in, in 2011. And um, so we haven't uh, yet explicitly engaged uh, the Federal Reserve yet, but it definitely is our plan to. And um, I do think it would, uh, we all anticipate it, it'll be a different conversation this time around. Mostly because we're only asking for 200 million. <laughs> All right, and if you know y'all feel free because um, I'm reading the questions for y'all, but if you want to go ahead and send them out loud, I want to I, I want to make sure I don't miss any. Um, and and just in the interest of time, this is a great conversation, and I want to respect you all's time. I know Sierra has a question, so we'll make sure that that gets in. And um, I answered uh, Siona's question really qu uh, quickly in the in the chat, but I think it's worthwhile. Let's talk about it out loud. Um, so Siona uh, in the chat perked up at your idea of a, of a CDFI co-op, Michael, and was wondering, um, is that a thing? Well, I mean, there've been informal discussions um, among CDFIs and, and certainly certain collaborations uh, in instances where, um, where uh, CDFIs have collaborated with each other, where a large CDFI has, has helped out a smaller CDFI in terms of managing certain elements of their loan portfolio. But, but it's, I would say it's uncommon. You don't typically see it. And, and there's been nothing in terms of a, a, a larger uh, you know, model of, of developing a, a sort of operating platform that any CDFI 
could own and, and, and join. Uh, not like you've seen in, in, in other sectors where you know, there are companies like CCA Global Partners, which has created these cooperatives for different retail businesses like bicycle businesses or something like that. That's demonstrated you know, the ability to operate more efficiently and save money by forming cooperatives among uh, uh, smaller types of organizations of the same type. They've organized a, a childcare uh, cooperative, for example, that has members from uh, most states across the country that takes care of a lot of their backroom stuff and recruiting and things like that. You haven't seen anything of that scale uh, among CEFIs. Thank you. And there is quite the conversation happening in the chat. So just for the recording, I also just want to make sure I highlight what people say. In response to Siona's question about the Federal Reserve, Peter said, uh, the Territorial Bank of American Samoa, a public bank, uh, obtained a banking relationship with the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco two years ago. Um, let's see, what else? I just want to point out what people are saying. Ruth uh, said, Bank of American Samoa meets retail needs when last private bank left. Um, okay. Ah, and uh, Peter said the Federal Reserve held an internal conference about public banking last year. Um, and then we get to uh, Sierra's question and some people answered Sierra's question in the chat, but I would like to read it out loud. And, and if anyone would like to say anything out loud, invite that. But before that, I'll just read what people said. So Sierra asked on the racial equity front, I'm curious about the ways that the Massachusetts Public Bank is planning to address issues of diversity and how dollars are spent or allocated. Uh, Peter says, and I'm not sure what this was in reference to, but Peter says, Representative Talib. Oh, okay, yes, there's a federal act. Yeah, Representative Talib introduced a public bank act. Other related federal legislation has also been introduced, such as for a national infrastructure bank. The Dov said, Sierra won key ways through the governance of the bank. Tomashi said, this is really good. The Dov said, which tries to ensure diversity. Another way is through the priorities uh, provision. Um, and then I'll stop there just so if anyone wants to address Sierra's question out loud, we can have that conversation. I'm not sure which question that was, but what's okay, come up a couple of times it. is the, the governance, which is really, really important. Um, if this gets through, uh, it'll be really important who the first president of this bank is because they're going to be in a position to make a, a lot of decisions initially about the direction of the bank and the culture of the bank. And that, that's a, a big appointment. And secondarily, the, the governance of the, um, uh, of the bank, getting the right appointees on, on the board, uh, not the ones who are there by, by virtue of their position, but are, are actually appointed. And there's an advisory board. I, I, you know, if I had it my way, I would have a, a bigger board. Advisory boards are too easy to ignore, and they're generally ineffective. And you can be really, you know, a good advocate uh, uh, and, and really push, but it's much better if you're on the actual governing body and not an advisory board. And I, I thought we'd be better off with a, a bigger board with broader representation, but I usually don't get my way on this. So. Anyhow. It's a good bill. I'm, I'm not criticizing the bill. It's a, it's a good bill, but governance is a huge issue because there can be a bank that we'll all be disappointed in, or there could be one that we're all excited by, and it's not going to be a function of the statute anymore. It's going to be a function of you know, who's running it and who's, who's the governance for it. So if, if it comes about, that's where we should really push to get appointments uh, to that board of people who we think really represent uh, those interests. Yes. And I see Ruth, you'd like to chime I could in? just add to that. First of all, under the bill, the uh, chair of the board is the treasurer. We had a very good meeting with Deb Goldberg, the current state treasurer, um, who tells us her staff will ask us hard questions. But she was, she was uh, very, very open and interested in this. I also wanted just to share that on the board of the eight appointed members. So the treasurer is the chair of the board and appoints the other members of the board, but under specified categories. And one category is CDFIs. Um, and another one is um, state 
private banks, but a third is credit unions or co-op banks. Um, and a fourth is small businesses um, and local government and environmentally conscious financing. Um, it's not a panacea, but it was is an attempt to have the board be somewhat diverse. And then uh, I hear what Michael was saying about the advisory committee. We spent an awful lot of time talking about the advisory board in drafting this bill and making sure that there was a portal for public comments to go into the advisory board, which the board of directors would also have access to and um, to have the board of advisors be very diverse. So just wanted to share that. Thank you, Ruth. And let's try to get one last question in and, and I see some uh, other good conversations happening. I'll put it in the, uh, I'll, just, I'll just read it out loud. Um, so, so someone asked, um, and I'm, I'm gonna skip over your question, Charles, because I think you and Adav are just kind of nerding off in the chat, if that's okay. Um, so Siona asked, is there a role for some sort of FinTech solution to meet unmet lending needs in Massachusetts or uh, the US? There's a lot going on in FinTech now. Uh, we're really looking at, at two positions. Number one is, how do we address fintech, which is bad fintech, which has been the predominant form so far, in, in terms of um, you know excessive interest rates and and, and fees, um, uh, as opposed to uh, fintech, where uh, a number of CDFIs and other mission-based lenders are looking at how fintech and and different types of algorithms to, that don't have discrimination built into them could, could be used to um, effectively cut costs uh, in, in terms of, uh, and, and, and accelerate time in terms of getting money uh, to the communities we're trying to lend to. So I'm not familiar with any that have been fully vetted yet, although there are a lot there out on the market now and, and CDFI is beginning to partner with different FinTech companies and test out how they work. And in particular, the um, uh, Connie Evans, who uh, runs the um, Microfinance Trade Association, I'm blanking on their name right now, uh, but uh, she's put a lot of time and effort in, in, into uh, looking at how fintech in particular might uh, assist in terms of micro lending. And there have been a, a couple models. I could get the, the information for you or, or introduce you to Connie if you are interested. Um, uh, to see what they've been doing so far. They've actually partnered with a big FinTech company to, to do a pilot in several areas. Thank you so much. And, I, and I'd like to close this out, but I do just wanna have people, um, I am just gonna read aloud the final questions and the responses that, that are in the chat. And then I know Peter, uh, your coalition is doing an event next weekend and I, I'd like you to be just be able to announce that. Um, so, uh, before I turn it over to Peter to announce uh, their event, um, these were the other conversations uh, happening in the chat. Uh, so first, Sierra reminds us, if you haven't read today's Eugene Wire, it's up on Medium. Uh, today's edition was Public Banking Edition. It was a conversation between our Culture and Communications Manager, Paige Curtis, and Chris Desan, who's a member of the Public Banking uh, Coalition, uh, who's a professor at Harvard uh, Law School, uh, whose areas of expertise are, are uh, money, like super, super uh, broadly. Um, so uh, Sierra just pulls out a, a quote from that um, interview where Chris says, quote, that is to say, we're turning the control over to those entities to nominate people. This is about the governance. And we hope that those entities will be in touch with communities of color and are conscious of the kind of engagement and representation we want across different racial groups, end quote. Uh, Charles asks, theoretically, how would public banks in Massachusetts or any other state be affected by a federal policy turn toward modern monetary theory? Would they be easier to capitalize and therefore more feasible? Um, Nadav says, Charles, I think the public bank is largely MMT, so uh, that's for modern monetary theory, neutral. 
Uh, Peter, in response to the governance conversation, says governance is critical, especially the composition of the governing rather than the advisory board. Um, going back to the MMT conversation, Adopt says, in other words, proponents and opponents of MMT could both support the public bank. Nora uh, says, another key issue will be what ratios underwriting requirements will be for the, for the public bank. If they follow traditional banking underwriting, they will miss the same borrowers and customers that are currently missed. Nadal says, Nora, absolutely right. Underwriting requirements should be more flexible. One of the key issues, savings and operating costs allow the provision of internal loss reserves. Nora asks, and unfortunately, we're not going to have time to dig into this tonight, but this would be a great next question to, to, to have a conversation about out loud. Nora asks, are minority financial institutions also addressed in the bill? The official name of banks owned, led by people of color. We should all be familiar with One United here uh, in Massachusetts. Charles says, thanks, Nadal. Um, uh, and then a bunch of thank you. Siona says, thank you. Sierra says, thank you. Uh, Siona says, this is so good and helpful. Jesse says, great conversation. Nora says, thanks to Gerardo, Michael, Nadav, and everyone for this thoughtful conversation. And I agree. Uh, Nadav says, great conversation. These are all fantastic issues people are, are raising. Jane says, wonderfully informative. Great questions. Thank you. Gerardo says, thanks, Nora. Great comments. <laughs> and finally, I'm on the last, oh, I thought I was. Finally, I'm on the last comment. Nadav says, Nora, he answers, on MFI's minority financial institutions, uh, the priorities provision should apply to them. Um, so with that, thank you so much, y'all. I wanna turn it over to Peter really quickly to talk about the Philadelphia Banking Coalition's event next week, and then we will stop recording and wave our goodbyes because there are no member team meetings tonight. Peter. Thank you, Nia. This is a, a great group of uh, participants and also uh, excellent speakers. Uh, I, I thought that, that what Michael and, and Gerardo had to say was spot on and uh, and it's really difficult to to deal with such a complicated issue that has so many moving parts to it uh, in a way that that just doesn't uh, become a, a mishmash. Um, we're hoping to clarify a lot of things and to have a good national discussion with a, with some local flavor to it uh, this Saturday. Uh, I put the the link in the chat and everybody is invited to to attend, although, it's in. It's a Zoom meeting for the Philadelphia organization, and we have a focus on the uh, the legislation that is currently going forward, hopefully to be enacted by the end of this year, uh, so that next year uh, we can get back together and talk about the operations of uh, the public bank because uh, we'll be starting in in that direction. Uh, but um, I think that that you will enjoy uh, coming to uh, to the visioning summit for a public bank that we are holding on Saturday uh, between one and four and everybody is invited. The, uh, the link to register is in the chat. Thank you so much for uh, letting me plug this, the, uh, the summit. Thanks, Peter. And why don't you drop the chat, the link in one more time because it's way up there now. And then uh, finally, we will sign off with uh, Gerardo uh, will be, uh, featured in an opinion piece in the Globe this Sunday. So it'll be in the, um, uh, what, do you, what is it called? Local, local the, section. The local section and it's a debate. Um, so it'll be a debate between Gerardo uh, and a banker that is opposed uh, to the public bank. I don't think we know who it is yet, um, but there is a poll that is attached to that article. So we encourage you to check it out um, and take the poll as yes. well. All right, y'all. The, the, oh, poll, Gerardo? The, the poll in, pay, in favor of Gerardo, please. Oh, of course. Of course Gerardo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful night. I'm going to stop recording now. Thanks, 